psychedelic research has experienced somewhat of a renaissance in recent years. I think that's thanks to Joe Rogan's try anything mentality. It's not DMT though, because DMT is rich in DMT. Get on that, Jamie. Pull up some DMT so we can see it. Which isn't always a good attitude. He's been able to make millions of youngins more open-minded towards the potential benefits of the hallucinogenic substances found in many naturally occurring materials. An hypothesis which predates Rogan Joe in his podcast suggests our evolution was not only helped along but driven by the consumption of psychedelic fungi. How much weight does this hypothesis hold? Have you ever read any Terence McKenna? I know you're familiar with something called the Stoned Ape Theory. Terence McKenna was an American ethnobotanist and mystic who spent most of his career advocating for the responsible use of psychedelic drugs to expand one's mind. He was one of the pioneers of the psychedelic movement and spoke and wrote on a variety of subjects involving entheogens, shamanism, metaphysics, culture, and so much more. In 1992, he wrote the book Food of the Gods, The Search for the Original Tree of Knowledge, a radical history of plants, drugs, and human evolution. Apparently, this landmark piece of psychedelic literature explores our ancient relationship with organic psychedelics and opens the doorway to a higher state of being for us all. In this book, McKenna proposes an hypothesis about the evolution of humans, which has gone on to be called the Stoned Ape Theory. It posits that the evolution from humans' early hominoid ancestors, like Homo erectus, to the modern human, Homo sapiens, was helped along or originated in the addition of the mushroom Psilocybe cubensis into the diet. He believed this addition of the mushroom into the diet of the ancient hominids occurred around 100,000 BC, which he believed to be when species began to diverge from the genus Homo. As the hypothesis continues, the desertification of Africa during the time of early human evolution forced our ancestors down from the treetops to search for new food sources. One of those sources supposedly being the insects that thrive in the dung of ungulate animals, which our ancestors would have then been in closer proximity to. Cowpats are a perfect medium for mushrooms to grow, as they do today. You can see where this is going. Those ancestors would then eat the shrooms and gain the main and alleged effects of the hallucinogenic psilocybin chemical. According to the hypothesis, a low dose of the substance can improve visual acuity and edge detection. This would have greatly benefited pack hunting and increased food supply and reproductive success. At slightly higher doses, the shroom acts to sexually arouse the consumer, which would have led our ancestors to a higher attention level, more energy, and potential for erection in males, and therefore higher reproductive success. At mega doses, the shroom would dissolve boundaries to promote community bonding and group sexual activities. Thus, the society is born. As more of our ancestors became free-living and less aggressive towards one another, their egos would become dissolved, more genes would get mixed, creating a greater diversity, and communal sense of responsibility would be instilled in the young. McKenna argued that at these higher doses, the psilocybin would trigger activity in the language-forming region of the brain to help manifest music and visions. This then catalyzed the emergence of language by expanding the arboreally evolved repertoire of troop signals. McKenna essentially posits that the ingestion of and access to these magic mushrooms was an evolutionary advantage to the hunter-gatherer ancestors, the evolutionary catalyst from which language, projective imagination, art, religion, philosophy, science, and human culture sprang. It's quite an hypothesis. Was he just pulling it out of his ass? Or is there anything to it? First things first, the name is a total misnomer. The stoned ape theory suggests that it's a scientific theory and it dumbs down the concept to something which can be mocked without fully understanding it. A scientific theory is different than a hypothesis, both of which are different than the everyday use of the word theory or how it's used in psychology. An hypothesis is simply the question or idea that you are testing. It doesn't need evidence to back it up, as it's simply a position requiring evidence. 
once there is a mountain of evidence in favor of the hypothesis, it may graduate to a theory. A theory has still not been proven as a law, which is an almost veritable fact, but it has so much evidence in favor of it that it functions as the factual position until another mountain of evidence is found to contradict it. But whatever, the stone ape theory sounds cool so that's what everyone calls it. The brain of our ancestors was small, as in our modern cousins, the chimps, gorillas, and so on. That size remained the same for a period of time, until species began to diverge from the genus Homo, starting with Homo habilis as the current oldest known example. It's now understood that the great encephalization of our ancestors, when the brain got big, happened relatively rapidly over a period of 1.5 million years or so, starting with Homo habilis with a brain slightly larger than a chimp at 600 cubic centimeters volume, then to Homo erectus at 800 to 1100 cubic centimeters brain volume, then to the maximum in Homo sapiens and Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, with a big juicy brain of about 1200 to 1900 cubic centimeters volume. There isn't much of a huge radiation or gap between early small brain hominids like Australopithecus and Ardipithecus. It's a pattern of increasing brain size from one group of apes to another, but the time frame is pretty short. The major flaw in McKenna's theory is the mechanics of it all. In order for this shroom to influence our evolution, it would need to find a way to get into and influence our DNA. It can influence an individual for sure, so long as they continue to take it throughout their lives, but it would never get passed down to the offspring. This means there is the possibility for it to influence the evolution of culture, but not biological evolution. According to Thomas Falk, a professor of philosophy and education at the University of Dayton, McKenna's idea may provide an acceptable explanation for what's been called the creative explosion, occurring in our ancestors 40,000 years ago BC. That's well ahead of our coming down from the trees and evolving bigger brain sizes, as this 40,000 BC time frame sees anatomically modern humans running around killing things already. According to Falk, the creative explosion occurred prior to the migration of Homo sapiens from Africa to Europe. It's here that an apparent leap in human cognitive ability is seen. However, modern humans began to migrate out of Africa between 100,000 and 50,000 years ago. This means this creative explosion occurred well after some populations of humans left Africa. This was the first time human species were living in worlds of their own creation, both materially and symbolically. They were capable of creating worlds in their heads and then taking those worlds to the real world in the mediums of art and socialization. According to Falk, other species of Homo were able to exploit nature, but were still passive subjects to it. I think that's quite a leap to assume that they weren't creative in some way. It's not like anything they made would have survived a millennia anyway. There are plenty of folks who defend McKenna's hypothesis, like Thomas Falk, but also other writers like John Horgan, who states that he thinks it a serious work presenting a rigorous argument. But how rigorous is it? The book doesn't have a ton of references, but according to McKenna's ethnopharmacologist brother, Dennis, the key references are there. Okay, fine. Dennis McKenna, who worked with his brother and is a researcher in the same field, doesn't take the hypothesis as the end-all be-all. He has said that it should be seen as one of many possible factors which drove human evolution. The biggest problem with the hypothesis is the lack of reference to the paleoanthropological evidence which informs our current understanding of human evolution. The supposed fact that magic mushrooms improve visual acuity has been heavily criticized by researchers as a misinterpretation of work done by experimental researcher Roland Fisher in the 60s and 70s. Fisher and company published findings on visual perception in very specific parameters, rather than acuity. There's overall a lack of scientific evidence that psilocybin does any of the things McKenna said it did, like increasing sex drive, making people more cooperative, and so on. The Aztecs, for example, used psychedelic mushrooms for their ceremonies and yet still were capable of violence in the case of human sacrifice. The use of psychedelic substances doesn't necessarily suppress the ego and create harmonious societies as suggested by the stone ape theory. It's certainly possible all our ancestors and cousins experimented with hallucinogenic substances and that it affected us in some way. 
But the idea that it directly moved our evolution in the direction that it is today is extremely flawed, and lacking pretty much any piece of evidence that would be needed to help support the hypothesis. So, what do you think? Got anything crazier? Leave it in the comments below, and I'll be sure to ignore them. Thanks for watching. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, hit the bell icon for updates, like this video, and drop a comment in the comment section below. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my elephant tier patrons, Thea Svensson, Staniforth Hopkins, Dinosaur, and Arda Bayer, as well as my Tyrannosaurus tier patrons, Henry Brennan, Danny Van Heck, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Admin.